Yes. All right. Well, thanks for coming to the inaugural uh, Sunday talk for ETA. Uh, I'm Kelly Franznick, for folks that don't know me. And I'm going to be talking about a, a project I uh, did, uh, many of you saw it in progress, that I'm calling Hexels. It didn't start out being called Hexels, but uh, sort of ended up that way. A uh, little bit about me, i uh, lived on the island for about 20 years. Uh, I'm not a developer, so don't ask me any code questions. Um, my background is industrial design and interaction design. And I co-founded a company in uh, Seattle and now we're office in San Diego called Blink. And we do user experience, research, and design work. So this project, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on the inspiration for it. Uh, it was really getting a, a new office space. So we moved from uh, the eighth floor in our building to the sixth floor. We're going to take over the whole floor. And we're doing some um, planning for that. And uh, at the same time, I uh, went to Fry's and bought a $249 3D printer, uh, a little, uh, I'm trying to, what's the, the box, the big ones we have? The Da Vinci's. Uh, da Vinci, thank you. The little Da Vinci Mini mm -hmm. is what I got for $249. So I was playing around with that. <clears throat> and our architect was coming up with the, the plans for the office space, and uh, we really uh, overcompensated for a lot of the shortcomings of our current space at the time, uh, in that we had a kitchen that was tiny, uh, could barely fit one of these tables in our little kitchen area for the staff to uh, eat in. And so our kitchen in the new space is this whole area here. So a significant portion of our uh, floor plan is going to be sort of this cafe uh, kind of social area where people can come out and work or eat or do whatever they want. But our, our sort of objective of that was to make it a cool place so that you can feel like you need to go to Starbucks to work. You can come out here to kind of our own little Starbucks and, and work. So the architect was, uh, was giving us renderings of this space and a little hard to see the light in here, but um, she had to slam the wall back here in the distance. And every time she'd do the rendering, she would have a different image on there. So up here, I think this is a uh, mural that was painted at one of the Facebook campuses. Um, and here, there's like a galaxy photo that she has in there, you know. And it just got me thinking, well, you know, that's kind of a cool idea. She thinks we're going to have some mural painted there. What if it was something digital that we could sort of change? The, the mood of the space. Uh, just another note, there was a, this sort of pivot wall here was meant to be able to kind of close that space off um, if there were certain things going on where we wanted to direct people over here. And, um, if that ended up, if we wanted that, it was going to be like $25,000 or something because there were structural engineers involved and all that. So that went away in our, our final space. So kind of made that wall even more so uh, she was doing things like developing the sort of style boards for the office, with what kind of materials were being used, and I, I sort of uh, hatched this plan for doing a, a digital wall here, and then saw the wall, and it was, was huge. It was 18 foot wide uh, wall in our space. So I really wanted to do something digital there, and I really liked the sort of uh, low resolution pixel things, like folks have seen the low metric clock. It's a, an IoT enabled uh, clock that you can hook up to your Twitter feed or do the weather service or you know every time there's a sale on your e-commerce site, you know, something can happen on the digital board. Uh, they have these sort of square pixel uh, uh, fields with the uh, LED matrix uh, behind it, uh, which I thought was kind of cool. But I wanted to give it a little bit of a more modern twist. So I thought about, well, you know, Blink logo has a little star, so maybe I use the star, or you know, triangle, or hexagon, or diamond. So I started playing with all of these uh, shapes. And uh, the other thing I needed to really contend with was the brightness. We have similar space here with a bunch of windows facing the waterfront, and really needed to uh, to find LEDs that were bright enough to be seen uh, in that environment during the. the um, so that was one of the problems I solved first, and uh, after doing a bunch of searching, uh, found 
some of these at uh, Ad Group. And these are uh, LEDs that have one single controller on uh, the, the LED unit, but they have four actual RGB LEDs on it. So this whole unit acts as one when you address it through an Arduino or other controller. Uh, but what's great about it is it's four times as bright in theory, uh, 12 volts, so uh, pretty, pretty nice little unit. The other thing that was great for my project was these are, are sort of epoxy potted, and they have a hole in the middle. You can see the back of them here is this metal, so you can put it on a board or a wall or whatever and you can screw it down. Meant to be, like I imagine, when you drive down to car dealerships on I-5 and you see the big signs up there and something like this was question. Yeah, it looked, it, these are, it's like a light stream? It's a strong? string of lights, a string of LEDs, yeah, that's right. And uh, they are uh, now know about a 122 uh, millimeters apart uh, from each other on the, the string. And uh, what was nice about this, uh, since I saw on, on uh, Andrew, uh, there were you know, it's neo compatible, I knew that. They wanted 60 bucks or something like that per string, uh, but I was able to find them on eBay for under 20 bucks a string. Um, sorry? 20, 20 per string? Yep. So, uh, bought some of those to start to play with and uh, use that as the basis for what this was going to be. So, the spacing of the LEDs, since I had such a big wall to cover, the spacing sort of dictated how big my, my pattern was going to be and how uh, large my shapes were going to be. Um, so this is one of the first tests I did. Um, I think this is a video, so I'll play this. So um, this is actually uh, some hot glue with those LEDs. And I bought a garden paver mold and uh, put that over it. You can still see the hot glue on it uh, with the LEDs underneath. And that's just a, a sheet of uh, paper from my laser printer uh, over the top to act as a, as a diffuser. Um, but it was a good proof of concept for me. I said, okay, this is definitely what I'm, I'm after here. So uh, was encouraged by that. But uh, as I looked into the practicality of you know, using these, it, it uh, sort of changed my mind a little bit. So these are 640 a piece. Question? Yeah. Oh, I have one more question. Sorry yeah. about the strings. Yeah. Are, are they, can you chain them? <clears throat> yes, you can. So um, here are the strings here. Uh, this is just a snippet of one. And you can daisy chain these as long as you want, as long as you can provide the power to it. Oh, no limit at all? Uh, not according to the manufacturer. I mean, there's be signal loss, I'm sure, at some point. But um, you can power and ground them at multiple points along a big long string and get away with doing, you know, uh, lots of these together. So it, it does, and I'll have some details on the power supply that I used there. Um, but what's great about these is you just address them zero through however many you have, um, you know, with your, your Arduino and uh, can, can tell them to do exactly what you want. That's right. That's right. So um, there's one controller. So think about it that you're really talking to that chip. And then that chip commands the four LEDs uh, all the same. And can each LED do any color? Or is one R, one G? Nope. Each LED is RGB. Oh. So yep. So you get the same color from, from all four of those. So. Yep. so my first attempt at, at saying, hey, you know, I've got this. Uh, this new 3D printer, I ought to think about 3D printing some of these things before I kind of knew how big this project was going to be. Um, so I got some uh, opaque white um, PLA and printed just sort of volumes like this, sort of thinking, you know, maybe it would be like, you know, Superman's lair or something, right? You've got these big white uh, pillars that, that change colors. And uh, here's just a lit example of that. So a couple of things that I didn't like about that, the, um, the edges, as you can see, is it, it freezes there. Um, you know, you've got this sort of line there. It just wasn't quite what I sort of was looking for in terms of uh, being pixely. And uh, 
having the sides exposed too, I think could be cool in some respects, but I wanted to be able to project images and things on this. So um, what I then decided to explore was um, doing something with solid sides. And I brought some of the uh, prototypes that I went through um, doing trial and error. I think this was sort of my first one, was saying, hey, you know, I could, could do shapes like this where I can run the string underneath. I have little screw holes for these things. And then thinking that, you know, I'd put some sort of white translucent material over the top. So I went through a few iterations of that, got some different types of um, plexiglass that was actually designed for doing uh, diffusion for LEDs. So it has a smooth white surface and then a rough surface that you put toward the face of the, the LEDs. And this stuff is awesome if you're looking to do LED projects. This one's a little thicker. Um, I ended up going with a thinner material. I'll pass these out. Um, but uh, got the material safety sheets on these. It's acrylic, so you can cut it in the laser cutter. Where did you find it? Uh, got those at Tap Plastics. Okay. Yep. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a slide with a few of those things, but it may not be as specific as what you're, you're thinking about. Um, and so one thing at Tap Plastics, they've got a lot of great materials there. Those guys don't know what they're used for, so you have to kind of go in and, um, and explore. But um, what they are good about, like that, that larger piece there that's thicker, is a sample. I just said, hey, you know, can I buy like the smallest amount? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. He runs in the back, cuts a little piece, and just gives it to you. So um, you can experiment with that stuff pretty, pretty easily. Um, there's one. Yep. And I uh, was also playing with different colors, and I had the spool of uh, Prusa silver, because at this time I realized that my little Da Vinci was not gonna hack it, so I ordered a Prusa and got that with a, a spool of silver, and, uh, and was really liking the contrast of the white diffuser and the, the silver sides of the shapes. The other thing that I played around with was the height of the hexagons themselves. I found that with that diffuser material, I needed to be at least 40 millimeters away from where the LED was to not get a hot spot in the middle of that lens. Um, so that kind of set my minimum height and then uh, played around with there with sort of how high I could go. And uh, my, my kids and I uh, are sort of uh, geology buffs and always go on summer road trips looking at crazy rock formations or fossil hunting or whatever, so I kept thinking about um, some of these uh, hexagonal formations that you see at volcanoes and really liked the sort of way that they, you get the depth variation there, so that sort of inspired the ultimate pattern. That's right. So uh, with that sort of came together, uh, I think this is one of my first tests with the, uh, the silver hexagons and the white diffusers um, and these four LED um, strings. So that was coming together pretty well. And then um, the other thing I wanted to be sure that I liked was just visually how these things looked, um, you know, when they even weren't on uh, for an office environment. So. This was sort of my first thought was to do something relatively small in scale, you know, maybe two feet by three feet or something like that or smaller. And uh, I sort of set up this demo for our architect who came through and um, she said, that's really cool, but you have to do the whole wall. <laughs> I was like, oh boy, okay. So um, that's when I uh, ordered more strips sort of started um, trying to see what the power handling of all of these uh, could be and um, hooked up a couple of different Arduino test patterns to, to play with those and, and started to think about how to, to go into production mode. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to do as, as this needed to get bigger was make it really easy to assemble. So what I ended up doing was um, designing a base plate that would slide into uh, the hexagon itself. So this is the little base plate. And so that has a little screw hole in the center that I can take the LED and align that up with. 
and just take one screw and go right through and secure both the base plate and the LED at the same time. Uh, and then it has little cutouts for the, the cabling to pass through. And then my final design, I have so many prototypes here. I have to see which one is final. Uh, this one's final. Um, so I have a little groove on the side as well on these. And so then this would just slide right over um, that base plate. And so that was kind of the final design and then having these at various uh, heights. Um, a good friend of mine on the island, Dan Gallivan, I don't know if anybody knows Dan, uh, is, is a mathematician. And so I, I consulted him about just trying to think about the distribution of heights, saying I, you know, I wanted something sort of mountain rangy that would give me a nice logical distribution of heights there. So uh, about 20 minutes later, he sent me over this amazing Excel spreadsheet where I could put in the number of, of shapes that I needed and then what sort of um, sharpness of curve I wanted, and it calculated how many of each size I needed. It was, it was fabulous, so it's good to have friends like that. Um, so from there, I had to go into production mode, so that's where um, Prusa number two arrives. Um, so I had two Prusas cranking out uh, at sort of all hours. Um, even the smaller ones still took about six hours to do two. Only two would fit on the print bed at a time. And so I would get to the office, well, I tried doing it at home. Uh, the Prusas got kicked out of the, of the house because uh, they were too loud at night. Uh, so moved them to the office. I'd come in in the morning, um, start, um, you know, four, two, two pair of two uh, at eight o'clock. And then around two o'clock or wherever they finished up, I'd start another pair and start cranking these away. Um, it was, was great because the office sort of got into, you know, what I was doing and, if there was a print failure, you know, I'd come back to my uh, desk and I'd see that somebody stopped the printer for me. Um, there was uh, uh, somebody who got in real early in the office and um, he, he learned how to start the print job. So I would come in and it would be printing away, which was great. Uh, but still at that rate, uh, I calculated that I'd need to do 800 of these. So uh, I enlisted the help of uh, 3D Hubs, which is a, a 3D printing service. So Literally anybody with a 3D printer can sign up for 3D hubs and call themselves a hub and then rent out their printing services. So I did a couple of tests with 3D hubs, um, just sending one shape and one base to a couple of different people just to gauge quality and found a guy in Bellevue who was um, really affordable and had um, good quality prints. So I ended up having him do about 100 of the top pieces and probably 500 of the bases for me, um, which was great. And he would send me, he didn't know what this was, you know, he had no idea what it was, but um, his whole family was guessing and they were all involved because, you know, these things were needing to be started and stopped at all, at all hours of the, the day and night. So um, I had a good experience with that overall. Um, there were a few, uh, hubs that I sent test pieces to that I really wasn't happy with the quality of what came back. So if that had been a one-off project for me, I wouldn't have been a, a satisfied customer, but since I did the one-off uh, as, as more of a test, it was fine. Um, it also, I found that the price varies wildly on 3D hubs. They have a website that um, when you say, you know, let's start and upload your uh, STL files, they will automatically suggest a hub for you and the price that is associated with that is whatever that hub price is at. Um, those prices were probably four or five times higher than what I ended up paying, um, but you have to hunt around on 3D hubs to find a way to manually select a hub and then see different people's sort of offers based on your part. Question? It's hard to say. Um, I think it's probably a little bit of, of both. Um, people list the equipment that their hubs have, so you can look at that a little bit, but uh, there were times where I would get a part back and um, this is the side that's down on the bed and you would just see that you know their settings were not quite right. Um, it didn't have a good solid finish to that and that was gonna be exposed to the, um, the end user, so I wanted to be sure that that was nice and, and finished well. Um, 
but the hub I ended up working with, I explained like what was going to be visible and what I really cared about, and they were great about listening to that, and you know even said, hey, if there are parts that you need reprinted, let me know, and, and I'll do it. Um, I also ordered a 3D printing handbook that's uh, written by the 3D Hubs folks. I got that on Amazon for like 30 bucks, and that book came, to my surprise, with a $50 3D Hubs voucher. So <laughs> uh, that helped on, on printing costs as well. A couple questions. Uh, uh, did, did you have to provide the filament that they used? Oh, great question. So um, typically the hub provides the filament, and part of the pricing is based on what um, filament you want them to use, the ABS, PLA, what color, and everybody has a different price range for those things. With the hub I ended up using, I said, hey, I really want to provide silver filament that matches what I've already been doing. Um, and he was fine with that, but said there isn't a way in 3D hubs to do that. It always assumes that you're using my filament. So when you place your order, select the cheapest filament, and then um, tell me how much the filament costs, and I'll refund you via PayPal. So we had this sort of side arrangement going on to get the filament cost back, which was, was great. Probably a violation of my terms of service, but uh, it, it worked. Do you know what brand he um, He had um, a... Um, trying to think what he had. He had an Ultimaker 2, and he had a couple of um, the CR-10s as well, and the he, the he had the larger CR-10s, so he could get more than two. I think he could get four on the bed at one time, which helped uh, with costs and, and speed as well. So, you know, one thing to note there, I mean, these are, are humans doing it on the other end, and, you know, often it's sort of an amateur side gig for them. So, Often um, the deadlines were missed. Didn't matter for me because I, I was doing my own printing and um, you know I'd place an order and say it'll be ready by January 10th. And then I'd get an email January 8th, hey, we're not gonna have all of them ready. You can pick up the ones that are ready, but you know it's gonna be the 15th or whatever. It didn't bother me, but just something to be aware of if you're doing something mission critical. And delivery was um, by mail or did you actually have to I, They will ship, they're set up to do shipping. Uh, but I drove out to his house, and he had a box on his porch uh, with my name on it. So I'd, I'd come and pick it up. So it was, was pretty slick. Were, were they all open the ones they recommended to you, were they local? Or were they yeah, the ones they recommended were, one was in Seattle, uh, one was in Vancouver, and one was, I don't know, Spokane or something like that. And I think what they're doing is finding the folks that are sort of the most reliable. It's kind of the five-star Uber drivers, so that my experience as a customer would be the best. Uh, but because I wanted to do so many, I really cared about cost. Um, so that's why I wanted to go in and, and select other folks. And so like the guy I selected had good reviews, but just hadn't been doing it that long. So um, he has, has more good reviews from me now. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, some of those folks, too, um, they'll offer engineering services. So, you know, they're kind of set up as, you know, a place somebody can go in and say, I've got an idea for a, you know, dog bowl, and they'll kind of do it all for you. So here's uh, my uh, shapes as they were starting to pile up at the office. Uh, I started putting them on tables and soon sort of ran out of table space. Um, also came in here uh, one day and uh, laser cut a bunch of those um, lenses. So as I thought about the lenses in the early prototypes, I, I had originally been thinking about putting them on top, but then realized that I really wanted them back behind this sort of lip. Uh, and then that became a challenge because um, you know you can't put them in after the fact. You have to put the lens in first and then attach them. So I ended up, this is a prototype, so you can see it's just literally this is going in and, and being glued in. There's nothing there to, to hold it. But in the final versions, my face out of here, um, I actually have a little reveal here, a little relief. So I can take these and push them in and they snap in place. And then I put a couple of dots of super glue in there uh, to hold them. So that went really quickly and, and helped speed things along. 
Um, I had a few of them fall out during assembly, but uh, overall, I was pretty happy with that process. So. so So um, I've got a slide for that, so just hang tight, I'll show you. Uh, so here they were sort of adding up. Uh, at this point, uh, I was kind of taking over one of our big uh, workshop rooms. That's not my alcohol in the back there, that was <laughs> from another project. Um, and so kind of had to start storing all this stuff in, in uh, big boxes. So on the electronic side, um, I also made some changes at this point. So originally I was going to um, use an Arduino for all of this um, and started looking at how I could do video files and shapes and things like that using Arduino to send to the, the um, board, the wall. And it's pretty limited. I mean, there are ways to do it, but you've got memory issues, um, you know, limitations of the Arduino. And I, I stumbled on this product called uh, Pixel Pusher that was absolutely 100% designed for what I was doing. Um, so I ended up uh, purchasing one of those and playing with it, and uh, it was exactly what I was looking for. So um, the final project uses two of these. Each one has, um, there's another row there, there's eight outputs on each of them that go to uh, strands. So what that allows me to do is solve a lot of the power issues because I can distribute the power uh, per strand. So with two of these, I have 16 outputs. So I use each strand has its own output. So that solves any timing issues, also helps with my power distribution. Um, it has these big uh, power inputs that I ended up removing and just soldering my wires to it. And then um, the company that made this, their um, they like do crazy Burning Man installations and things like this and designed it for those projects. And then um, built, did a Kickstarter or something with it a long time ago and now they just sort of sell these. Um, so they were a great resource too. I talked to them about the power consumption that I was gonna have because these strands uh, are, take up um, so much uh, power. Uh, and they provided a lot of great advice. One was there are some jumpers on the circuit board in this thing that you use to set whether you're gonna power it externally or internally, whether it's gonna, this thing is five volt. So um, if it's five volt, you set the jumper one way. If it's 12 volt, you know, you adjust it another way. Um, and uh, she said, uh, you know, take, instead of the jumpers, because that's sort of the weak link for the power uh, that you're gonna send through there, um, wrap some wire around it and solder it. Uh, for, for power, and then you could run 30 amp per pixel pusher. So that's what I ended up doing, is using two of those. Um, what else is great about these is there's a, you can't see it on the side, but there's a little ethernet port on here, and so you talk to it through ethernet, and um, you can use um, processing. I don't know if anybody's used processing, but you can connect it to processing. Um, you can um, send DMX like lighting signals to it and it'll respond to that. There's a little USB port on it and so you load a little configuration file on a USB drive, um, stick it in there and when it boots up, it looks and says, oh, I need to look for DMX or processing or whatever. Question? How do they communicate with each other or are they peer to peer or are they not peer to peer? So um, you, need to make, you need to put it on a network and then um, you talk to it via IP address. So your controller says, hey, you at IP whatever, go do this. Okay, so yeah. you have a master and the two pixel pushers are like slaves. Exactly. So I started uh, messing around with processing and then discovered um, an iOS application called LED Lab. Um, and this program, um, one of the features of this program is it will talk to a pixel pusher. So now I can control from an iPhone or an iPad uh, all the graphics that I want to display, which solve my how do I display video and all these other things. I can also put it in sound reactive mode. I can use the camera on the iPhone and take whatever scene I see and map it to the wall. So I was like, oh, this is, this is Nirvana for what I want to do here. So um, that was a, a great discovery. Pretty, um, it's more on the expensive side, like your basic setup for the iOS program. Uh, if you want to control a wall like that with a pixel pusher, it was 99 bucks. Um, so it's the most expensive app I think I've ever purchased uh, at the, the app store. Uh, but it's, it's been awesome. Question? How much are the pixel pushers? Pixel pushers were under 200 bucks. 
and uh, they are. Yep. So then I had to power all this. I think there was a question about that. So I ended up, um, instead of getting just a raw 12 volt, 60 amp power supply or 30 amp power supply, um, I bought one of these, which is set up for doing security cameras in a, an office or wherever. Um, what was great about that is it had this sort of utility case around it. Um, they only come in beige, so I had to spray paint it white. Um, and then I stripped out all of their, they've got all these sort of distribution uh, ports so that you can run each camera to its own little uh, power supply. Um, so I ripped all that out and just used the power supply in this box. Um, and so I had two of those and ended up um, putting a pixel pusher in each one. And then um, I've got a Jinvu smart strip here so that I can pull up an app on my iPhone and turn the whole wall on and off. And then I've got a, um, there's so much to talk about here. Um, the uh, iPhone that I was using to control all of this has to now talk Ethernet so that it can talk to the pixel pushers. So there's an iOS Ethernet adapter that you can use. Um, however, that doesn't like, um, doesn't like to also be used uh, for charging. So I had to go through a bunch of different iPhone power adapters to find this Belkin unit that would be powerful enough to actually let the phone recognize the Ethernet uh, adapter that was, was plugged into it. Um, so that was one of those things that was an unexpected issue that came up is um, every time my power would dip a little bit, the Ethernet would turn off. Uh, but then using this adapter, everything worked fine. And so I was trying to simplify this as much as possible. So this is a little uh, network router. Um, what's great about it is it works from 5 to 24 volts. And so I was able to wire that directly to the power supply. So that eliminated, you know, one more plug. So um, basically, uh, power supply and pixel pusher in each one of these. Um, this one has an iPhone and an Ethernet adapter in it. And then that one just has a pixel pusher to it. And then I've got my little router with um, one Ethernet going to the iPhone, one going to pixel pusher one, one going to pixel pusher two. So the Kachin, do you have to like open that up and pull out the iPhone to see the adapter? You do. You can set up timing, so I have kind of a, a playlist set up in it, but if I wanted to, you know, if we had a party or something and I wanted to go change it, I have to open up the box and change what's shown on the, the iPhone. Did you uh, investigate the possibility of wireless controlling the Ethernet adapter? Yes. So the first thing, I very first thing I did was wireless. So my router, instead of being that, was a little um, Netgear, uh, two port um, router with Wi-Fi abilities. Set it up that way, I could connect my iPhone to it wirelessly, was awesome and you know lit up the LEDs and they would go shh, shh, shh. Um, And uh, where I was in Seattle, there's just too much wireless traffic and so it was getting interrupted periodically. Uh, and that was, um, I talked to both the LED labs and the pixel pusher folks and they were all like, yeah, if you're doing an installation, um, you gotta go hardwired. Um, there's just, there's no way to avoid those wireless problems. So it um, would have been awesome to do it wirelessly, but just wasn't practical. I, in my mind, I thought as long as I had my own wireless network, I'd avoid all those issues. You know, I'm not gonna be on my work's busy network. I'll have my own little wireless network. Apparently wireless doesn't work that way. So. This is right under uh, where the LED wall is. Okay. So, yep. And you'll, I have another photo where you'll see that a bit more. Any questions on that? Uh, so, assembly day. So, um, nothing like a deadline to make things come together. Uh, we were having a big grand opening uh, office party, and uh, this is a couple of days before I had everything I needed and, and the time to start assembling it. And so use some half-inch uh, pre-finished plywood to lay this stuff out and uh, started putting things together. So um, those are all my base pieces mapped out. 
um, the first board, or at least the first couple of rows I did, I measured very precisely and lined everything up with a laser level and the whole nine yards. And by the end, I was just like, yeah, that's about good. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is uh, these strings um, were really not spaced very accurately. So even when I had the bases exactly positioned, I'd have to do a little bit of give and take for the spacing of the strings. Um, so that was a good lesson is, you know, either give yourself more play in there or just sort of go by the, the spacing on the strings and not the, the bases. Um, but overall, there was, there was no set of uh, pixels that were um, too close or too far away to give me any problems. So it, it went together pretty well. Yeah, and up prior to this, I'd only done a small prototype, and exactly. And this is like two days before the party, right? Yep. Um, you're screwing them, you're screwing them in or you I'm screwing them all in, yep, yep. And then um, the top parts, um, I used some um, E, what is it? The glue, uh, there's white and black uh, E6000 glue that I used that uh, is just an awesome glue I use for a lot of stuff. So um, the process here was to take um, some E6000 if it needed it, if it was one of these outside uh, edge pieces, a little couple of dabs of that, otherwise some hot glue on these things and uh, put the tops down. And uh, I was doing this and realizing how long it was taking me and uh, put a message out on Slack if anybody had time. And before I knew it, I had a a good group of folks from the office in there uh, helping put these things on, which was really fun to see. And uh, it was, uh, was a good team bonding experience as well. So they're, they're supporting each other. Like that's why the bottom ones had to be heavier here. Yeah, that's right. The ones that were on the outside, I was worried about them more than I was the ones that were on the inside. And the other thing that I was having people do when they were um, putting the inside ones in is a little dab of hot glue to its neighbor um, to help it kind of be one unit instead of just being supported by those base plates. And so you're still following that spreadsheet for height? Mm -hmm. That's right. However, the, uh, the placement of these, I did not prescribe. So I encourage people to just randomly pick one up and put it where your next one is. So the final configuration um, is 50 by 16, so 800 hexels. Uh, for the open house, I only did rows of 20, uh, 20 by 16. So it had two of the pixel pushers, one of the smart switches, two of the, that should be 30 amp power supplies, a total of 60 amps, but um, two of the 12 volt power supplies, um, that 12 volt router, and then the ethernet adapter, and then the Belkin adapter, and um, an old iPhone 5 in that case. So this is what it looks like in the space. That's with the 20 of them um, back there. And I put the little rendering in there too, which is kind of fun to see. Uh, pretty, pretty similar views in there. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, people in the office have really liked it. Um, I always have it doing sort of different things uh, during the, the day. Um, you can see the relationship of the box to the wall here. One of the changes I want to make is to, uh, because of that issue with having to open the box and get the iPhone out, I'm actually going to um, drill into the wall and route a lightning cable behind the wall. And they make some pretty slick iPhone uh, mounts for like wall mount iPhone mounts. So I'm going to actually mount the iPhone into the wall so that you can just walk up to it and uh, adjust it as needed. Uh, kind of. I am, yeah. I've got all the parts for doing that and just haven't had the time to to mount them up there. And the good thing is, is you know, it's all wired. So um, all I have to do is, you know, essentially just plug them in and screw them down the line. Uh, two questions. So right now you're controlling per row? Yep. Uh, each row has its own control? Yep. Okay. Yeah, and the great thing about that LED lab software is you go in and tell it how your strips are aligned. And so, you know, you tell it whether it's a matrix or a switch, how they're arranged, right to left, left to right, up to down, however you have them set up. And it's smart enough to then say, okay, and, you know, I can send an, an image to this and it'll 
accurately show up. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that's yeah. Another thing that's cool with the LED lab software is um, you can go in like I did and say I'm using strips right to left, and then it knows what to do. But it also has a pixel mapping functionality. So um, one of the earlier photos, I had my printer in the background and a bunch of pixels on the desk. I literally took my iPhone and put it in LED mapping mode and held it there. And then it fires the LEDs off one by one and gets the coordinates of those and then maps it out. Um, so you can have a jumble of LEDs and have it map it and show an image, which is, is pretty cool. So uh, I saw a project that the Pixel uh, Pusher folks did where they had a big glass case and just shoved it full of LEDs and pixel mapped it and then showed an image across it, which was pretty neat. Yep. I know they last a, a long time, hopefully they will, but do you have any plan if uh, a strip or a LED set of four fails or anything? Yeah, my plan is to really, um, I can pop up one of these individual hexels and get at it and then kind of, I probably will destroy it in the process. So I'll have spares to go back in and do it. And I'll just have to go in there and, and solder it back in place. Uh, but I did get extras. Yeah. Any failures so far? Uh, no failures. Nope. And the other thing, you know, doing this, literally we put it on the wall 15 minutes before the open house. Uh, and it all worked, which was, it was great. Really well. Yeah, thanks. Um, so it, the color is really quite vibrant. Um, I got a, a video here. I can show you of some of the different patterns I have it doing. Um, I was, you know, thinking that it, you know, might be slow with these long strands or other things like that, but I've had no timing issues at all. The bright light in the top right is just a, a light in our office there that's kind of in front of the wall. Um, but it's, it's been fun. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing the rest of it, uh, and getting that all, all finished up. I know um, somebody said, oh, you know, would you be interested in doing a, a class, of, you know, doing this in the ETA studio or something? And I said, no, I didn't even think about it. I was like, no, I never want to do this again. <laughs> I'm so sick of it. I've printed these things for so long. Um, and then uh, just a couple of um, lessons learned I thought I would share, because uh, half the reason I do this kind of thing is to, to learn. Um, I don't think I'd ever 3D print something at this scale again. Um, just not, not a practical way to do it. Um, I want to do more LED projects for sure but uh, not, not gonna 3D print them. I'm gonna CNC cut uh, to, to do it instead. Um, the team building piece of this project uh, was a real pleasant surprise to me. So that was both in the ETA studio. I know like all of you guys, you know, saw these things on the printer and sort of knew what was going on and, and talked to me about the project. Um, at the office, you know, everybody, uh, starting the printer for me and stop and failed jobs and things like that was, was really fun. And then um, about two weeks before our open house party, uh, we acquired a company in Seattle that moved into our space. And so I sort of sit by this team and you know, they're looking at this guy over there like 3D printing and wiring stuff going, you know, what the heck is going on over there? Like, I don't think they really quite got it. And then when this thing all came together and was up in the space uh, working, um, they were all like, oh man, that thing's awesome. So it was kind of a nice uh, icebreaker with those guys too. And, and so those were uh, totally unintended things that were, were nice outcomes for this. And then my, um, my favorite lesson learned from this was, um, does anybody know these things? I guess they use them on boats, but I had never used them until I had a real need for them. But um, it's heat shrink tubing with adhesive strips and low temperature solder inside the, the tube already. So once I had the wall um, up, go in the, once I had all these things wired, I had all these strands hanging down of, of cable, and then I, um, I had to take them all and join them to my connectors for the pixel pushers, which have really specific little connector ends on them. And that was just gonna be hours and hours of soldering. Um, but these little um, connectors were awesome because you just strip the ends of your wires, stick them in, and take a heat gun and you know blow the heat gun on them for a couple of minutes, 
these things shrink, hold your wire in place, and then you see this little blob of solder just suddenly relax and flow through your copper and you're done. It's the most amazing thing. I'm like, where have you been all my life? <laughs> Um, I was looking for, um, I knew that there were butt connectors that you could crimp, but I've had really bad luck with those and doing like car stereo work and stuff. I just find that they never are reliable, that they'll come loose after time. Um, but so I was just looking at options for that on Amazon and found these things that had uh, heat shrink for marine use and then found the, the low melt solder ones. And they have them over at Vetco Electronics in Bellevue. So they were awesome. All right, so that's my hour. Questions? What do you think the overall cost is? Oh, God. Um, don't tell my CFO. I don't know. Um, I have, trying to think about the big costs here, the 16, so 30. So I probably have, you know, close to $2,000 in the LEDs, and the 3D printing was probably relatively cheap. I mean, the, I designed these things to be two layers thick, so it wouldn't use a lot of material. I, you know, used less than 10 spools of material there. Um, so it was really the LED cost, and then a couple of hundred bucks on the pixel pushers, so. Yeah, that's right. So all the electronics, the power supplies and all of that is probably 600 bucks, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. If I was billing an hourly rate, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, I don't have a video recording of that, um, but I'll, I'll get that and um, post it on Slack or something for folks. I did, um, you know, the, uh, the Blender video of Big Buck Bunny? Uh, it's kind of a free video that's, that's a cartoon. Um, I played that on here, scaled it down and, and played it, and you could really see, like, there's a butterfly flying across and all of that, <laughs> which was pretty fun. And we had a client in the office when I was doing that, and he stopped me, um, client I didn't know and he said oh I've got the the like original cut of Star Wars I'll send it to you you know you can play it on the wall you know and I just heard somebody on that project that they're like you know he still wants to do that so uh, we'll, we'll get that going and show you so yeah yeah it'd be fun so I have done some um, some images some videos like logos and things and to my surprise they're they're legible uh, on here so uh, it was, was uh, Pretty low resolution, but uh, works works pretty well. So. Any videos or photos to tell us that, that, that are you know, tied to this at all? Because he'll put on Slack, we'll also put them on Facebook if, you, if that's an easier way to reach. You know, sure. Connect that way. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what's a good way to show us the? Um, I, I'll get to them. If, however you tell us. Great. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.